I'm Dr. Ohenya Gold, and this is Science on the Street. The year was 1993, and the summer monster movie Blockbuster was promised to be a first of its kind. Dinosaurs were coming back to life in the form of Jurassic Park. This was exciting news for me, a dino-enthused six-year-old. At that time, and for many decades previous, dinosaurs had been marketed only to boys, so having them appear in such a wide-reaching medium was a chance for audiences of all walks to engage with the topic. Unfortunately, I was not allowed to watch it in the theater as I was deemed too young. There were very few dinosaur movies available at that time, one of which gave my entire generation EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! Additionally, when you want to see this, and you get this, it's just not a good time. Eventually, I got to witness the majesty firsthand, and I watched with the same expression Timmy had when he looked at Alan Grant. For the first of countless times I watched Jurassic Park, I did so as a dinosaur enthusiast. The T-Rex was amazing, the Velociraptors were incredible, and the Dilophosaurus scene with Nedry was too scary for me to watch. This was the first dinosaur movie to show dinosaur behavior as we understood it. Sauropods, the long-necked dinosaurs, were once thought to be swamp dwellers, but in the 1990s we understood that they were terrestrial giants, fully able to support their weight on land. Spielberg paid homage to that by showing them walking out of a lake in the first glimpse of them in the movie. We knew that T-Rex was an efficient predator, but due to its weight, it could not run. Instead, the movie shows it walking at a pace fast enough to keep up with a speeding jeep. Velociraptors got to show off their braininess, even if they are shown at three times their actual size. On the flip side, Dilophosaurus was shown smaller than life size, and with some questionable additions like venom spitting and frills. As the movie franchise continued, additional dinosaurs got their spot in the limelight. Stegosaurus was also portrayed larger than life size in The Lost World, amongst other movie magic. In 2001, Jurassic Park 3 showed dinosaurs like the South American Carnotaurus and, more importantly, the North African Spinosaurus. This sail-backed, long-snouted dinosaur was first discovered in the early 1900s, but that specimen was destroyed in World War II during the bombing of Munich. Paleontologists had found other pieces, but nothing to complete. That is, until 2014, when more of the skeleton and limbs were found. This discovery redefined the body proportions of Spinosaurus from this to this and revolutionized our thoughts about its biology. Fourteen years later, Jurassic World plunged us again into this alternate universe where dinosaurs and people coexist. A nostalgic experience for many of us, but also a missed opportunity to show updated dinosaurs as one of our guests pointed out last time. Instead, this new park focused on genetically engineered monsters like Indominus Rex. Beyond dinosaurs and dino-like creatures, we see Mosasaurus, a marine reptile and not a dinosaur, and many species of pterosaurs, which are flying reptilian cousins of the dinosaurs, but not dinosaurs themselves. In the epic conclusion of the franchise, we finally get to experience something that I and many other paleontologists had waited for since the 90s, a fully feathered raptor. We've known that many dinosaurs were fully feathered for several decades, and to finally see one on screen was incredible. Besides this, a feathered Therizinosaurus graces the screen. These dinosaurs were 15 foot tall herbivores with three foot long claws on their fingers. Cretaceous weirdos, but very interesting. Other theropods are meat-eating dinosaurs, like Giganotosaurus, and more recently discovered giant sauropods like Dreadnoughtus are featured. This movie takes the chance to show additional non-dinosaurs from before the Mesozoic, like Dimetrodon and Lystrosaurus, which are both more closely related to us and other mammals than they are to other reptiles. This franchise has given paleontologists the chance to showcase our science with the world. It has become a pay-it-forward phenomenon in which many early to mid-career paleontologists were dino-enthused kids when Jurassic Park premiered, studied our whole lives to become paleontologists, enjoyed the new Jurassic Park movies as they came out, and in some cases became the scientific consultant for the new movies. And this new trilogy will influence the next generation of paleontologists. I was one of those kids, in total awe of the dinosaurs the first time I watched Jurassic Park. Then something amazing happened. While I was in my PhD program, I rewatched Jurassic Park on a bus, and for the first time, I watched it as a paleontologist. 
It became an entirely new movie experience for me as I could truly empathize with Alan Grant as he first saw the Brachiosaurus and experienced the fear and awe inspired by the Velociraptors and T-Rex. The same awe that I still feel when walking up to giant dinosaurs like the Titanosaur in the American Museum of Natural History. Between that and watching the finale, it has been an incredible journey over the last 30 years as the series has grown with many of our careers in paleontology. Even though there are inaccuracies throughout the franchise, these movies have given us all a common language from which to educate the public about our science and share that amazement with everyone. Kids enjoying these movies today will become the drivers of paleontological research in the future. We welcome them all. Uh, I'm sitting down with Dr. Steve Brusati from the University of Edinburgh uh, to talk a little bit about his role in uh, as a scientific consultant in Jurassic World and in Prehistoric Planet. So welcome, Steve. Oh, Anya, a pleasure to connect. <laughs> I haven't seen you for so long since, I guess, before the pandemic, like most things, but good to see your face and uh, you as well. Dinosaurs, yeah. Yeah, so Steve and I go way back uh, to, I think, 2007 is when I first met you for the student committee yeah. of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. So. When you were, yeah. yeah, you were at Maryland and, you know, and plotting your future, trying to figure out what you want to do for grad school and so on. You ended up in the right place, of course, at AM&H. And, &H, and <laughs> yeah, we overlapped a couple years together there. And it's, it's been cool to, you know, see our careers take off since then and you know always yeah very for sure with the work you've been doing as far as um research and yours. Also, well thanks but I, but i think the you know the book that you did with uh, abby is super cool one of my favorite examples of just out of the box you know sidecom so well done thank you i very much appreciate that um when you look back on your own uh career and your own adventure in paleontology you started from a, a small town in illinois and now you're a, a, a big name professor in paleontology. What would you say to kids or students today that feel a little bit like the weird one for wanting to study paleo? It's, it is funny to look back and to think about it, you know, these journeys that we take uh, as scientists, as researchers, um, and, and just as far as life and family and jobs and all these things, I never would have ever envisioned growing up, you know, back home in, in Ottawa, Illinois, and the, the cornfields, you know, in the Midwest. I mean, beautiful, wonderful place to grow up, but a small town. I never would have thought I'd one day you know, be Scottish. You know, I've been in Scotland for a decade. I'm a British citizen now. I have a, a son who is very much Scottish in, in every way. So it's been a, a, a very um, unpredictable journey and a very fun one. And ultimately, the thing that's kept me going is just my enthusiasm for the work I do, my enthusiasm for fossils, for dinosaurs, for evolution, uh, and my passion for teaching it and communicating it to people. Um, I did start out really when I was in high school. I was not one of those little kids, one of those five-year-olds who we all know, and we meet them all the time. But I was not one of those five-year-olds who knew the name of every dinosaur and could pronounce them all and spell them all. I wasn't like that, but my youngest brother, Chris, he was like that, in large part catalyzed by Jurassic Park, seeing that film in 1993. I was nine, Chris was five, and you know, he was maybe quite young for the film, but it, his love of dinosaurs really took off. And then just growing up with him, every day talking about dinosaurs that just gradually wore me down i think and, and by the time i was in high school now all of a sudden i was obsessed with dinosaurs and and it became just a, a real passion a true passion and i read as much as i could and i dragged my parents to museums and uh this was when we had just got the internet really as a family this was in the, the late 90s very different internet from today but i you know i used the internet i I would visit the websites of museums. I would email scientists. I joined discussion groups of paleontology enthusiasts. Uh, and really all of this, was, I became part of a community of, of people who were like-minded from all over the world that really liked fossils and dinosaurs. And, and I felt very welcome in that community. And I, that, that was so important for me because I very much was the weird one you know, in high school. I was the dinosaur guy or the fossil guy. <laughs> it was just a strange, kind of thing, you know, to, to, to be enthralled with. 
Uh, so I did feel like the odd went out quite a bit, but still my enthusiasm for it kept getting me through it. And then it got to a point where I saw that there was a legitimate way to make it into a career. I kind of came to understand how you could study geology or biology in college and then uh, start doing some research, getting some practical experience, working in the lab, doing some field work, building up your skills and, and then actually making a career out of it. And that's what I did. And I haven't looked back. I've had a lot of fortunate breaks in my career. A lot of, you know, really good things have broken my way. I have no real complaints. I've had some great mentors. I've been given some amazing opportunities. I've been taken uh, by, you know, my mentors and my colleagues at different field sites around the world and been given awesome fossils to work on. So I feel very, very lucky and very privileged. And I just try to be, you know, that uh, a fraction of that sort of mentor to my students today. <coughs> You mentioned that Jurassic Park has been a, a big influence for a long time. So 1983, it's, it's been over 20 years. I have to do math. Anyways, yeah, 93, 30 years? 20, yeah, almost 30 years. Yeah, 29 years. Oh my goodness. 30 years. Okay. Remarkable. So Jurassic Park came out in 1983. It's been almost 30 years since, since the movie came out. What has been the biggest paleontological discovery in dinosaurs since that first movie? I think it's unquestionably the feathered dinosaurs. And I think the fact that it's now taken until film six of the Jurassic uh, franchise to get proper feathered dinosaurs really illustrates that point. Because when Jurassic Park came out in 93, nobody had ever found a fossil dinosaur skeleton with feathers on it. There was plenty of evidence that birds evolved from dinosaurs. That goes all the way back to the time of Huxley and Darwin, you know, 1860s. Uh, but nobody had ever found feathered you know, dinosaur fossils. And then three years later in 1996, the first dinosaur skeletons with feathers were reported from China. And then it, these, it opened the floodgates, you know, and it, it was farmers, it was mostly farmers in China that since that time, continuing today have been finding all of these amazing fossils and bringing them to museums. And it's because there was this, uh, you know, these entire ecosystems that were buried by volcanoes, almost Pompeii style. And that captured thousands and thousands of not just dinosaurs, but mammals and pterosaurs and turtles and lizards and plants and bugs and like the entire ecosystem. It captured them as fossils and it locked them into stone and the feathers didn't have time to decay. And so it was really this unique window very strange type of fossil preservation that allowed us to get our first glimpse of fossil feathers. And by dumb luck, bad luck in a way, that came three years after Jurassic Park came out. So, you know, in 93, Steven Spielberg, he didn't know dinosaurs had feathers. If he tried to put feathers on those dinosaurs, I don't know what people in Hollywood, Hollywood would have thought about them or what audiences would have thought about. They would have said, these aren't the dinosaurs. We know what is this? That's crazy. Feathered dinosaurs, what's the evidence for that? And you say, well, there is no evidence. So, you know, it just wasn't even a possibility in 93 to put feathers on big screen dinosaurs. But so quickly then with the fossil discoveries in 96, those Jurassic Park dinosaurs were shown to be quite inaccurate. The real dinosaurs would not have been covered in scales. They wouldn't have looked like overgrown lizards. A lot of them would have had feathers. Some would have even had wings on their arms. They would have looked much more like birds than, than reptiles. The real Velociraptor would have had feathers and wings. And what could you do? You know, by, by Jurassic Park was so big, those dinosaurs were so iconic. They were, they were movie monsters of, of just the highest order. They became a brand, they became a style. You couldn't just change that quickly. And that's been what's been, you know, holding back, I think, the franchise for a while. But in the new film, finally, there are some dinosaurs with feathers. And this is something that Colin Trevorrow, the director, he was committed to from the beginning, from the first time I met him, like literally the first time I met him, one of the first things he said was, I want to finally do feathers on some of these dinosaurs. And do you want to help me out with it? And, and, and I, of course, I was overjoyed to do it. And it was that moment that told me that Colin was really serious. And of course, I accepted right away his offer to help him out. Yeah, so talking a little bit about how you got brought into the Jurassic World franchise and to Prehistoric Planet. Um, how did that feel? How did that feel getting that first call of, of interest? It was surreal, and it still is surreal for, for Jurassic World. For Prehistoric Planet, it was kind of a long, grinding battle because that's been in production for like a decade. 
Uh, but for Jurassic World, it, it really was literally an email out of the blue one day. And in uh, the summer of 2018, uh, I got an email and the subject line of that email was, I read your book. So in, in April of 2018, I published this book called The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. It's a pop science book for adults. It's just about dinosaurs. A New York Times bestselling <laughs> pop yes. science book for adults. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it was very, you know, it, 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 it ended up, you know, exceeding my, uh, my expectations. It was a huge ride, just incredible to be part of it. And, you know, and, and of course, a lot of people going to making a book. So we had great artists, Todd Marshall, you doing the art. I have the best agent and the best editor, publisher. I mean, a huge team effort into making that book a good book. And, you know, and people read it, which, which was great. <laughs> and, uh, and so arguably the, people, the most important part of writing a book exactly, is having people read yes, it. If you write something, you want somebody to read it. <laughs> and, uh, and one of those readers was Colin Trevor. So that's, you know, the subject line was, I read your book and the sender was, you know, Colin Trevor. Well, of course I recognized the name right away. This is the guy who directs, you know, the, the Jurassic World film. So I opened the email and uh, it said something along the lines of, Hi, my name is Colin. I make scientifically inaccurate dinosaur films, and I just read your book. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm based in the UK now. Uh, I might be coming up in Edinburgh. Do you want to meet up and talk dinosaurs? And I thought no, this is must be a joke. Like I thought, you know, this must be one of my students who's just like yanking my chain, just trying to to have some fun. Uh, maybe it's Ohenya. Maybe <laughs> maybe it's you. Just. <laughs> or one of our other illustrious, you know, former <laughs> AMH uh, student colleagues or others in our orbit. Maybe it's somebody that used to be at our tables at SPC, our famous. Uh, I, I, I have someone in mind who, who would pull a prank I'm like that. I'm thinking of somebody. I'm not going to say it for lawsuits. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but, uh, but, I, but I did. Seriously, I thought somebody, somebody's playing a joke. Somebody's having some fun with me, you know. And uh, and so I forwarded it to my uh, to you know to my, my publisher and and uh, book agent and stuff and said I got this email this this is crazy if this is true but is it true could we look into this and and they passed it around to some people they knew and you know kind of a few hours later they came back and said yeah yeah we connected with some people that have worked with Colin that is his email and okay so I replied we had a phone call it was him. He did come up to Edinburgh uh, for the Fringe. We have this big arts festival every uh, August here. And so Colin came up with his family. And so like me, Colin's an American guy, but he's moved to the UK, he's raising his family here. And so they came up to, to take in part of the festival and, and they, Colin's wife and kids went off to see a show. Colin met me, we talked dinosaurs for a few hours and hit it off. And, and it was a really fun conversation. And like I said, he told me right away, I wanna put some feathers on some of these dinosaurs. And I want a lot of new dinosaurs in the next film. And so it was right around then, you know, the last Jurassic World had come out a, a month or two before. He was now in the mode of, okay, we're going to make the next film. What's it going to be? He was starting to plot that out. So he wanted feathers. He wanted a lot of new dinosaurs. And um, he started throwing around all these names. Do you know about this dinosaur? Do you know about that dinosaur? I couldn't keep up with him. I mean, he, he, had, he was so into it. And he knew about a lot of the new discoveries. He was asking me a lot about Moros, the you know, uh, tiny little tyrannosaur that, that came a little bit later in the process, actually. But that's one example of a dinosaur that um, that he was just enthralled with, you know, just recently discovered. It was Lindsay Zanner described it uh, with Pete McAvicky and it was a small little tyrannosaur. It hit the news and, and, and Colin saw that and he just he loved it. He read as much as he could about it. He wanted to know everything about it. So he was really like on the pulse of new dinosaurs. And that impressed me right away and it showed me he was serious and throughout the entire process colin and the artists um the you know guys the production designer a guy named kevin jenkins and uh some of the guys who were doing the art whether it was cgi art or animatronics or puppets because it was all three by the way in the film um guys like david vickery john nolan like these are the, the creative geniuses behind the dinosaurs they were all really engaged they all really genuinely liked dinosaurs they wanted to learn about them they wanted to know what the real dinosaurs were like uh and so i felt uh that you know my uh, input was respected throughout the whole process that's awesome it's really important to, to have that sort of rapport with the people you're working with especially when this is one of the main ways that the public is going to experience these creatures so to be able to portray them as accurately as we can at this point, I think is really important. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think when it comes to reaching the public, 
you know, there's so many ways that, you know, people like you and me that, that value uh, outreach and education and communication. And there's so many ways we try to reach the public. Uh, you know, teaching is a form of that. Writing books is a form of that. Doing lectures, doing, you know, YouTube videos, doing blogs, uh, you know, working with the press, um, giving commentary on, on new discoveries, doing press releases on your own discoveries, doing talks at the local libraries or books. I mean, there's there's so many ways to engage the public. And, and I try to be very diverse in the ways that I do it. But when it comes down to it, I, I don't know if there's any medium of communication in the world where you can reach more people around the world of all ages and backgrounds than a blockbuster summer monster movie. So, you know, I knew from the start, look, you know, this is not a, a science documentary. These dinosaurs in the film are not going to be 100% perfectly scientifically accurate because the science is only one of many things that has to go into designing relatable, exciting, movie monster characters with personality that can carry a story in a movie with a budget of 160 million dollars that has to make a lot of money so the science is part of that there's lots of other competing threads but that's the nature of the beast if you know if you're going to work with something like a blockbuster film um for me i just uh saw it as my role to always make sure that the real science the real fossils the real dinosaurs were always in the ears of the hollywood people that were making the movie and doing the magic. Okay. This is this is a softball, <laughs> softball question. <laughs> out of out of the entire Jurassic franchise, what is your personal favorite scene? Well, I would have to say, if I had to choose one scene, I automatically go back to that first experience in the cinema, 1993, nine years old, watching my, my dad, and my brothers. And I remember a lot of seeing the, the movie. Um, and of course, I've watched it and rewatched it many times over the years. Uh, but the, the scene that, that always uh, I'm drawn back to is when Sam Neill's character, Alan Grant, you know, the paleontologist, when he first sees those brachiosaurus and he pulls, you know, off his glasses. I mean, it's just a scene of just absolute wonder and joy it's it's you just get the sense of you know as a paleontologist now you know what would it be like if somehow some way through i don't know cloning through a time machine through some some rip in the space time fabric i don't know some way you know i was able to go back and see a t-rex in its world doing what it did. I mean, I, I, I just, I, I don't know. I've studied the bones of T-Rex. I studied the evolution of T-Rex. I've spent a lot of time thinking about T-Rex, but, you know, it's all based on these fossils that are these inanimate objects. What would it be like if some way, somehow I could actually see a real one? And I think that scene captures that of a paleontologist being like, oh my God, this is a dinosaur these are the things i've been digging up and studying and here it is and this is real and so i i just think sam neil nailed that scene and um i i love it i think it just it conveys joy and wonder and ultimately that's why so many of us are interested in dinosaurs because they were awesome they were big they were weird there's nothing really alive today like them of course there's birds but you know, birds are the descendants of dinosaurs. They're one very peculiar type of dinosaur. You look outside, there's nothing like a T-Rex or a Brontosaurus or a Stegosaurus or a Triceratops today. These were awesome animals and they're fun and they're engaging and they're in your face and you want to learn more about them. And I think that one scene conveys that more than, than anything else in the films. I agree completely. That's one of my favorite scenes. And experiencing it as both a child interested in, in dinosaurs and then as a paleontologist, are two very different experiences and to have both in a single lifetime it's very cool yeah. yes it is and we're in this weird category of people that you know can can say that that can have those different perspectives which is fun what are you most hoping for or looking forward to in like the next decade of paleontology research there's so much happening these days i mean there's more paleontologists than ever before there's more young people in the field than ever before. The field is more diverse and more international than ever before. Uh, there's more opportunities than ever before. 
That's not to say there's not challenges with funding and jobs and, and so on, but I mean, at least compared to what things were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, and my goodness, before Jurassic Park, I mean, there's just so many more people working on fossils, going out and finding fossils, using new technologies to study fossils. So it's really hard to predict where anything is going. You can never really predict the next discovery. That's the awesome thing about a discovery science. When you go out and look for fossils, who knows what you're going to find? You might find nothing. <laughs> a lot of times we find nothing. Or you might find a new species. Or you might find a new species that's so radical that nothing like it's ever been seen. So you just don't know. But what I think one thing that we can be pretty confident of is that paleontology is going to continue to borrow technologies and techniques from other disciplines. And it's becoming more technical, more computational in many ways, but just it's becoming richer and more diverse as we have different paleontologists using techniques from engineering, from chemistry, from physics. I mean, some of the things that have been published recently is, you know, reading uh, Yasmina Wieman's, you know, recent paper on, on uh, metabolism and dinosaurs published just a few weeks ago. I mean, these kind of chemical techniques that she's using, that she's pioneering, these are things, I, you know, somebody like me would have never thought of, you know, and here they are, and they're being marshaled to understand, you know, the very deepest nature of these dinosaurs, how they grew and how they metabolized. And so I think new technologies are going to continue to come in. Uh, techniques borrowed from different disciplines, and there's a lot of very bright young people going into this field that each person is bringing their own insights and their own experiences. So as long as we are able to maintain an, an environment where we have a community that's open and tolerant, um, there's great things still to come. We are nowhere near close to finding all the dinosaurs, and there are still so many mysteries about dinosaurs that remain to be solved. I agree completely. Let, let's uh, look forward to the, the next 10, 20, 30 years of paleo research. Well, Steve, thank you so much for being on Science on the Street uh, this week. And um, we should chat again soon. <laughs>